Okay, everybody. Welcome to Go in Five Minutes again. Uh, I am coming at you from Iceland. Uh, we just finished up GopherCon Iceland. Uh, today was uh, the community day uh, where a bunch of gophers uh, and myself included, we all hung out uh, and took a bus tour around some of Iceland. Uh, that was an awesome time. Uh, but I thought the talks were really amazing uh, this time around. Uh, we got to see tons of talks from people who are new to the community, uh, people that it was their first time talking. Uh, and really the coolest thing was we got so many new perspectives. Uh, we got people talking about ray tracing with Go. We got people talking about computer vision. We got best practices. It was just really, really cool to see everyone come together um, and fly from all different corners of the globe to this little tiny island. Uh, in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. So really, really cool. Uh, so today uh, I wanted to take kind of a special day. Uh, I'm not going to do the normal five minute thing, but there are those that are going to be coming. Um, but instead, I wanted to just go check out this issue. Um, this issue posted by Nader.js. Um, he's basically asking, um, what should I do for real life development? Right? Like I'm not building necessarily some crazy um, RPC microservice uh, in the middle of some big company. Um, but I want to like build a web app um, or like build an all-in-one kind of thing to get your mobile app off the ground or um, maybe something a little more exotic, but like deploy Go onto a Raspberry Pi. Um, so things that are sort of outside of that sort of initial impression that Go gives a lot of us, which is it's, you know, a hardcore network systems language. So um, I want to go over just a few of my favorites. And you can see I've got more than a few tabs open here. Uh, but don't worry, I'll go through them pretty quick. Um, but I hope that they're going to just paint a picture for, for you, Nader JS, and, and hopefully for everybody else, um, sort of what packages might get you started uh, down the road of building something on your own or with a small team. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. So first thing is uh, a lot of us like to build CLIs. Uh, I love to build CLIs. Um, maybe not everyone <laughs> loves to build them as much as me, um, but I'm big on it. Um, a lot of times like I'll build a server, some kind of a website or whatever, uh, and I want to build a CLI to do some administration on the website uh, or the website will be like a REST API and I want to build a CLI to talk to the REST API. Um, so I've gone and bounced around to a bunch of different CLI libraries uh, over the uh, last maybe two three years. Um, Cobra is definitely the best, uh, at least for me. I did a screencast, I don't remember when, uh, a while ago I did a screencast on how to use Cobra. Uh, I think I also maybe did one on how to use uh, an older, uh, older CLI. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it now. Um, but anyway, uh, I, uh, I digress. Uh, Cobra is definitely amazing. Um, I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, the docs are amazing. I really love, obviously, to give everyone uh, projects with great docs. You can see that it does indeed have amazing docs. Um, it even has something, uh, where is it here? Uh, it even has code generation. This is what I'm looking for. So you can head over to the docs here and check out like how it can generate a skeleton for you uh, to get started on your CLI app. So CLIs are a great way to kind of get started with Go2 if you want to just automate something. Um, it's kind of a great way to replace maybe a shell script or something like that. So anyway, that's my uh, sales pitch for Cobra. But um, really, I mean, this is a good place to get started if you're trying to build uh, your app. Um, it's the entry point uh, to a lot of like client side stuff that you're going to be doing. Uh, I don't have any stuff in, in this list here for uh, GUI things. Um, so UIs, you're kind of on your own there. Uh, but CLIs here, th this is a great, great package to check out. All right. So on to the next one. These are going to be a little bit scattered. That's kind of on purpose. Um, but uh, this library is like meat and potatoes. Uh, it's just a library to generate different kinds of UUIDs. Um, there's not a lot of docs on the GitHub page. 
but there are a ton, a ton, a ton of docs on the godoc.org page. Uh, you can just, you know, I'm scrolling through it like I always do. Uh, almost everything is documented really well. Um, and just generally speaking, like this thing is pretty easy to use, right? Like if you want a UUID, you call new UUID and that's it. You get one, right? And UUIDs, if you're not familiar, they are, they stand for universally unique identifier. So this is great stuff. If you are building a website, you got to store something in the database, right? Like who will, who builds a website and doesn't need to store data, right? So this is a great way to store data with like IDs, data that's not going to like overwrite something else because it'll have a unique ID, a universally unique ID. So super good utility. Uh, I kind of think of this library as like the backbone to a ton of websites and a ton of like low level system stuff too if you're into that. Um, it can also be the backbone of a lot of client side stuff too because they have to cache stuff. They sometimes have to store data um, or they just need to identify whatever it is, right? This is super useful for that. All right, moving on. I talked about like UUID uh, and those are definitely uh, more computer friendly, right? You've probably seen one. It's the, you know, a bunch of hack, uh, a bunch of alphanumeric stuff and then a bunch of dashes and it's not pretty, right? But it's good if you're putting stuff into a database and pretty much only the machine's going to see that. Um, but there's some human friendly stuff out there too. Uh, I love this thing called Moniker. Uh, it's built by one of my coworkers. Um, so uh, you're welcome, Matt. I'm uh, giving you some free press here. Uh, but but seriously, like this thing is just dead, dead simple. Um, and it'll give you like some, you know, clever little cute names, old whale, wrinkled lion, kneeling giraffe, etc. cetera. Um, I often use this in my test code uh, when I have to maybe generate a bunch of, uh, a bunch of structs. Each one of them has names in it. Uh, or I've got to, you know, insert a bunch of sample data into a database. Uh, or, or whatever, right? Uh, I love using this because the test output is just so much easier to digest. Like I can figure out uh, why my eating iguana didn't match my old whale uh, a lot easier than I can figure out if my, you know, ACD1H-5DX is not equal to this other crazy UID, right? It's just plain old, easier to see. Uh, I'm a human just like you, so it's easier for us to read languages instead of computer gobbledygook, uh, if that makes sense. So yeah, Moniker is awesome. Uh, it's also used in a couple of Kubernetes-related libraries uh, to kind of just assign a name automatically to, uh, to something. Uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes Helm, uh, it's, it's used extensively in there. Um, same thing with Kubernetes Draft, same deal. Um, just gives things, you know, a nice little flair, cool little names. Um, so go check that out. Uh, if you're kind of in the, in the market for a way to name stuff, uh, you don't really need universally unique, um, but you kind of want it to be human friendly. Definitely go check that out. Okay, so I'm going to skip over all these. Uh, these three, you can see they start with Go Buffalo. Uh, I'll get back to those. Uh, so for now, though, let's check out Tommel. Um, so you may or may not have heard of Tommel. Uh, you may or may not have heard of like YAML. Uh, there is this kind of great religious war. It's uh, one of the modern <laughs> religious wars in computer programming over uh, what configuration file should we use? Uh, what file format should we use? All right, so there's JSON, there's XML, there's YAML, uh, there's like I and I files, there's homegrown stuff, uh, yeah, and there's Tommel. All right, so Tommel is my favorite these days. Uh, I'm sure it, you know, changes for everyone every day. Um, but I'm pretty happy with Tommel. Uh, this is kind of like what a simple Tommel file might look like. Pretty easy to write, pretty easy to read. Uh, and it's fairly performant, too, if you're trying to parse, like, a massive Tommel file. So I would definitely check this out uh, in bonus points because the uh, organization name of, of this person who built the library is called Burnt Sushi. Uh, I didn't even know you could burn sushi, but <laughs> apparently you can. Uh, and so this is a really cool library to check out. So go burn your sushi, uh, check out some Tommel, 
uh, you know, try to, if, if you've got to do some config for your next website or whatever, uh, try it out. Pretty, pretty convenient to use, pretty cool. So on to the next one, uh, JSON Web Token. Um, this is not like a Go specific thing. This is a great implementation of JWT. Um, but JSON Web Tokens are just a pretty convenient and easy to conceptualize way to do auth. Um, specifically like authorization stuff. Um, you just kind of store everything into this hash map that's JSON. Um, and it just says like, okay, I hold this token. It says that I'm an admin, so I can log into the admin interface um, or whatever. There's other roles. You can make up any role you want. This says that I am the hot dog ketchup and mustard dispenser. So I'm going to go and dispense the hot dog and ketchup. But this other person has a different token that says they can only do onions on the ha on the hot dog, uh, so uh, that was my uh, my cool little metaphor because I've been eating a lot of hot dogs in Iceland. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, th this is a great thing to check out. Um, there's kind of a learning curve here for JWT in general. Um, there is a website you can Google. Just just Google like JSON Web Token, and the first result will be. Uh, kind of a great little overview and it'll give you like a sandbox to test things out into. And once you do that research, come back here, uh, come back to JWT-Go um, and it's just super easy to use once you get the idea. Um, and if you are building a website, and this is mostly relevant to websites, um, if you are building one, this is going to make your life just simpler. Because you don't have to deal as much with like rolling your own authentic uh, authorization authentication scheme and so on. Um, this just kind of gives it all to you. It gives you a nice little model. So on to the next one, Redis. Uh, most people have probably heard of Redis. I would I would bet like ninety five percent of the people watching this probably heard of Redis. If you haven't heard of Redis, just Google it. Um, the TLDR is it's a key value store. Uh, it uses a cache, it uses a database, uh, but whatever it's used as, it's really cool because you get data structures over the network. So like you can send an RPC call to Redis um, to add a key to a map or uh, append something to an array or it even has like advanced stuff like queues and so on. So Redis is pretty awesome. I use Redis a ton just in like hobby products and stuff, projects and stuff. Um, and this library, Go Redis, uh, is just pretty rad. It's just kind of makes it fairly simple um, to get started. Uh, you really can just like copy and paste this, uh, and then all of a sudden you've got this client. Um, and then you do simple stuff on the client too. Set, get. Uh, there's not uh, there's not too many more examples here, uh, but if you do go to the examples directory, you can see more um, on how to how to uh, kind of interact with Redis in more advanced ways. Uh, but basically, you create your client and then you're off to the races. And this lets you build some super advanced stuff. Um, you can go up here and look, you can even do like pub sub and you get transactions and rate limits. You can do locking. There's a lot of stuff here um, that's just really rad because you get it all out of the box. So definitely check out check out Redis. Uh, you're gonna want to like understand Redis, uh, what it's used for, um, and just make sure that Redis is right for your project. Obviously, just before going to check this thing out. Um, but if you're looking for you know a weekend project or just to mess around with something, check out Redis. Check out Go Redis and just you know have fun. Uh, next one, WebSockets. Um, WebSockets have a time and place. Obviously, they're basically for you're building a website. Uh, there's probably some other ways to use it too, um, but obviously, you know, they're they're designed for websites for use in websites. Um, so if you don't know what they are, um, go check it out. Maybe it's good for your website. Um, but once you do decide to use WebSockets, uh, the Gorilla WebSocket library is by far the best. Uh, I think there are some others out there. Uh, you can roll your own too. Like there's one that's sort of part of the experimental standard library, uh, but really Gorilla just makes it easier for you. So um, there are some examples here. You can go in and see all these examples. 
just sort of how to use the library in the context of different use cases like chat or watching a file, client server, all stuff like that. Um, so really powerful library, but you just got to make sure, obviously, that WebSockets, the technology, are right for you. Okay, last one before we go to Buffalo. Uh, Testify. Uh, I recently did um, an episode on how to write test suites with Testify, uh, but there's more. There's more to Testify. Um, the test suites are here. Uh, they kind of wrap asserts and requires. Um, so you kind of get all three in one, which is super nice. But you can use asserts and requires on their own. So you can, you know, write a normal Go test and do something, you know, I want to assert that this thing is true or this string is that or whatever. Um, and require is kind of the same as assert, except it'll fail the test right there uh, instead of, you know, erroring it and keep going. Um, Awesome support for mocking. The way that they do mocking is really interesting, and really straightforward. Um, so that's a good one if you're kind of in the market uh, to, you know, you need to mock something out. HTTP, uh, also pretty cool. Um, I believe it's, oh yeah, it's deprecated right now. Um, they may, maybe I saw somewhere they might be coming uh, out with a new package. Um, but really what I'm trying to get at here is go into this package uh, see what they're doing. If you need to get into some hardcore HTTP testing, uh, testing your server or testing some remote API or testing your code against some remote API or whatever, um, there's some really nice practices in here. Um, but yeah, this would be, you know, you're getting a little bit more advanced. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, great docs. Again, look at all this. This is amazing. I love docs. I heart docs. Um, the Go doc is just as good to so um, if you're looking to like up your testing game, I, th I think that's what I said in the, the episode description for Testify. Um, I said, if you're looking to up your testing game, go check out Testify. Um, really do that. Uh, it, it's just worth your hour, worth your half hour to just see how you could be testing and go. And, you know, maybe it won't work for you, but at least you'll know it's out there. All right. The last three are Buffalo. So I talked about Buffalo twice now to uh, the two most recent screencasts. I'm just calling them the Buffalo series. Uh, I mean, how do you say what Buffalo is in a sentence? Uh, I'm pretty much just going to say, I've said this before too, I'm pretty much just going to say that it's Rails for Go. Right, I mean, it doesn't do absolutely everything that Rails does. Uh, it's not nearly as old as Rails. Uh, it doesn't have as many contributors, whatever, 5 million contributors that Rails has. Um, but it is it is the Rails for Go. And if you are building a website, uh, particularly if you're building like a UI, you know, like GitHub or, or whatever, something like this, use Buffalo. There's really no reason to go try and roll your own Buffalo anymore. And that's what you're going to have to do. Buffalo figures out auth for you, figures out templating, it figures out like all the lower level force SSL kind of things. It gives you like this nice Buffalo dev, it gives you testing out of the box. Um, it, it also just has this nice property that it's just figured out what the right packages are to use, right? Like it picked up Gorilla Mux. Gorilla Mux is maybe it's not the fastest router. Oh, he even says it here. Maybe it's not the fastest router, but the Buffalo folks think it's the most powerful router. And before Buffalo, I used it, so I agree. But if I hadn't used it, honestly, I wouldn't really care because it is part of Buffalo. Buffalo kind of curated it for me and put it into a nice, easy-to-use thing that I can use, right? And where there weren't the greatest things out there, uh, they built them. Buffalo Plush is for templating. Buffalo Pop is an ORM. Uh, here's where they chose Gorilla again for... Uh, sessions, encrypted sessions, cookies, um, WebSocket support is coming to Buffalo and it's going to be based on Gorilla WebSockets. Um, so really, like this is your kitchen sink. If you are building a web app, I'll say it again, just start here at least, right? Because you're just going to get a lot of learning from from day one. You'll, you'll, you'll go in Buffalo and knit and it'll generate your whole site for you, all the directories and files and stubs and everything. And you'll just kind of like get that huge bump that'll push you forward like a week, maybe more, 
um, into your process. And even if you decide later, hey, you know what? I don't really want to go with Buffalo. Well, at least you'll have a ton of code that's generated that you can use outside of Buffalo as well. So yeah, I, not enough thumbs up in the world for Buffalo. So moving on, we're going to go a little deeper into Buffalo with Plush. So Plush is a templating engine for Go. Um, it's pretty simple, pretty easy to read. I think in the most recent, yeah, in the most recent, in episode two of the Buffalo series, I think that might have been episode 22, if I'm not mistaken, of the Go in 5 Minutes series, um, there were kind of some hints in, in the little peaks of plush templates. Um, but if you've seen Rails or if you've seen any other template language, you can kind of guess what this means. Right? It's just like a variable substitution. So that's one thing. It's, it's kind of just cool to be able to read it out of the box. It is, by default, not quite as complicated as the built-in Go templating, but you can get more complicated if you want. And when you do need to get more complicated, it looks easier to read. It's, it's nicer, and you can kind of grok it a lot quicker with a lot less reading uh, than if you needed to do the same thing with Go templates you know, the, the built-in Go templates. So again, great docs. Docs are getting better every day as well, uh, mostly in the form of like new use cases and new examples and stuff. Um, but great docs. This is one of those things you can use outside of Buffalo, no problem. Uh, it was built to be used on its own and then integrated and wrapped inside of Buffalo. Um, so really, really nice. Um, there was just very recently the creator, Mark Bates, uh, he put out a video uh, called like Plush Tips and Tricks or something like that. Uh, so just Google like Go Buffalo Plush Tips and Tricks video, something like that. Um, it'll pop up. It's on Vimeo. It's a super great watch. Um, I've been using Plush for, I don't know, maybe, maybe nine, ten months, something like that. Not the super longest, but I've built, I think, four like non-trivial websites now with Plush. Um, I thought I was at least intermediate, maybe advanced with it, but I learned so much in that 20 minute video. So highly recommend that, highly recommend Plush. And let's move on to the very last one for today. Pop. Pop is an ORM. I don't know if they say it's an ORM outright because as you might know, um, ORMs have kind of in the past been a, a dirty word in the Go community. Uh, yeah, so here it is. They say, is POP an ORM? I'll leave it up to you to decide. Uh, well, I will come out and say that POP is an ORM, and it's a very nice ORM. Um, it's not, by default, again, out of the box. The simple case is super simple. It's really easy to understand. Um, they take some best practices from Rails here with an ID and a created at and updated at and so on. Um, and that's cool. Uh, they automatically like give you a nice configuration file that they just read for you. Um, they give you code generation and let's see if it's down here. Oh, migrations, that's what I was looking for. Um, and then just like they bind your data to a struct. So you don't really have to care anymore about doing low level SQL queries and stuff like that. Um, you just put in like plain English pretty much. Uh, you obviously got to understand how SQL databases work, um, but you know, assuming you do, you don't have to understand them well. But assuming you understand the basics, you know, you do something like this, and you get back a bunch of users that have those IDs in them. So not too hard, right? And this is another one of those deals where you know it lets you open the escape hatch and go deep into SQL and binding the data to the struct and everything. But really, when you do that Buffalo init, you get stuff that just works in your models and your database interactions, right? And even if you decide not to go with Buffalo, well, you could still use pop if you wanted to. If you don't want to, well, you still have structs and you can try to bind your data in your database to the structs in some other way with some other framework or library or whatever. So yeah, the last one is pop. Um, if you're looking for Buffalo stuff, it's all under github.com slash go Buffalo. So, um, you know, highly recommend all the other ones, but really, uh, I think the meat and potatoes of what you're going to want, uh, assuming you're building a web app, uh, it's going to start with Buffalo. So yeah, go check out github.com slash go Buffalo. 
Uh, and I'll just throw a huge shout out to Mark Bates. I think he created, uh, he definitely created Pop and Buffalo and Plush. Uh, he's created a couple more, uh, actually a, quite a few more kind of supporting libraries for Buffalo. Uh, and there are just some awesome maintainers as well uh, on the Buffalo project. Um, all of you, you know who you are, and thank you so much for everything you've done um, to make Buffalo awesome. Yeah, so uh, I will put up links to all of these libraries that I talked about today. Um, highly encourage you to check them out. And if you found a library that you think is interesting and it's not on this list, go into the issues here. GitHub, AR Schles, go in five minutes, separate with hyphens. Just click new issue and, and tell me about it. And if I haven't heard about it, I'm going to ask you a million things, and then I'll do a screencast on it. Uh, or I'll ask you to do a screencast on it, if you want. Um, and if I have heard about it, or I can research it, then I'll do a screencast on it. I'll give you the shout-out and everything, right? So, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Um, again, I'll just put all these links up for you. And uh, I will see you next time. Keep on rocking, everybody.